Okay, welcome to the Blind Sense Podcast. I'm Mike, your host, and my co-host. Morris. Yeah, we're back. And we're not episode. sick this time. How about that? Woohoo! I sound normal again, damn it. <laughs> anyway, do the thing, Morris. <laughs> All right, I'm doing the thing. Okay, I so that's all we needed for the thing. Yeah, well, it's it's magic. I can just fit it wherever. But today, I guess we're talking adventure, uh, Adventuria Compendium. Compendium, yes. So it's a pretty interesting book, I think. So, anyways. So, uh, I mean, like, there's a lot of ways we could go through this, but I think you know, as we discussed before, probably <laughs> just diving in by table of contents and working our way down yeah, is probably just the best. touch on the things we we appreciated in each of the sections and so you know this, this will by not far include everything we thought was cool or everything that we thought was bad because you know yeah so, i honestly didn't really find much bad about it honestly myself well so. i'm i'm gonna be rude for a second here and say that um, the art was kind of varying in quality in this version. And it's like, let me see if I can find it. Not quite as good as it was last time. Like, yeah. I, th- well, I, I think there's it. at least two artists working on this that they have different styles and I prefer the one to the other. Because like, oh, that one of Carolyn's really good. Um, but fine, see right. one of the ones. Here's one I didn't like. Like the uh, the um, archetype. What is it? What is the, the iconic character? Maybe that's what I'm looking for. Iconic. The beauty of the night witch and this uh, oh. noble here in this picture with uh, like they're fighting and lightning bolt Yeah, I suppose them. that would be archetype. I, be, uh, I think they call archetypes in the system where they're those would be at least those are the ones where they well like in the first one you had Carolyn and whatever. Yeah. Oh, I, I guess now they would be iconic because they don't snap those up anywhere. <laughs> But, uh, so, you know, long and short of it is, is like, I just saw if I'm going to be hypercritical, like varying degrees of quality in the art here. And I, I just got to say that cause I'm a dick. <laughs> well, that's what art is subjective to. So something you like might, I might love, although I can't see it. So it doesn't really matter to me, but yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's all a moot point to you. Um, yeah. but like there were a lot of, uh, interesting things in this uh even in the beginning with like um play style that we saw before that we've already experienced in the game and then it gets into like uh special scenarios and special techniques that you might use and social skills that you might have and um that progresses into like more a more advanced explanation of things like seduction um and nature skills that you can pick up and modifiers are there. And I know I was, I was saying to you, Mike, where it's like, at first I didn't see the point of having all this stuff. It's like, yeah, these modifiers are just, you know, it's common sense that a DM would do this to you. But the more I went through them and saw all of what there is, uh, the more I kind of, got this clear idea it's like okay okay so it's not so much the fact that there are modifiers it's kind of given dms a feel for what the modifiers would right. potentially well, be it's not necessarily pushed to an experienced dm too it's like more point to the people it's like well i don't know what to do so you know yeah that's hey, a I'm fair point. This, so what do i use for modifiers and stuff it gives you examples of what those type of modifiers are so yeah but but for me i think the value in it like already being familiar with some of this idea is is it didn't make clear to me what necessarily the modifiers would be which that's something that a dm's got to play around for themselves and see what works um but it gave me many more ideas than i previously had uh what kind of challenges you should put before players or like alternate ways that players might be able to deal with challenges basically gave you some more ideas yeah 
treat poison, treat wounds, leather working, making like forging ropes uh, or forging ropes. Yeah, making ropes and and forging, you know, like weapons, uh, weapons and, stuff, yeah. and yeah, all that sort of thing. Um, I know the thing you were talking about before the podcast was the tree soul. Yeah, now that was really interesting to me. The just the thought that you could treat soul to the degree that, um, let me see if I can find it here. Is it like you can find a, a negative quality of a character. Yes, there it is. Uh, suppress down. the negative trait. And, you know, so da, 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 example, all characters are thought to have a healthy dose of curiosity, but since Ladriel set a trap, the last time the group searched a tomb, Mirabon tries to have a serious word with her, or, or rather she sprang a trap. Um, before the group enters the tomb, this time of the Scorpio Wars, the GM asked Mirabon's player to do a check on Treat Soul, suppress negative trait. She does not succeed. Ladriel promises not to touch anything, but then, full of joyful anticipation, she steps towards the entrance of the tomb and completely disregards the bargain once something arouses her curiosity. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, they're trying to, hey, I'm just going to, you know, oh, that, that looks like an interesting thing to touch. And, you know, see now, like, like Indiana Jones picking up the, uh, you know. Yeah, picking the up the idol, idol and the ball comes down kind of thing <laughs> throw me the idol I throw you the whip no time to argue <laughs> exactly. I, I can't not reference that since you brought it up but um, no like the uh, something else I was thinking of was a scenario where uh, say a character talks to themselves when they're you know stressed and like they're muttering to themselves and the other character's trying to shut them up because you're trying to hide from somebody who's looking yeah, for trying you trying to stealth yourself around or whatever yeah that's yeah, that could work too. Now there's obvious if you're going to talk to them, you're going to make noise too. But if yeah. you're going to do that, well, before presumably you that would be situation. like right before the jackbooted thugs kick the door down looking for you, type of thing, and you're hiding under right. the floorboards was my mental image. Because it it gives you, I think, depend on your QL how long it lasts or whatever. So because I think it only lasts for like minutes at a time to be able to do that, but. Eh, it could be useful in certain, like I was saying, it's like, oh, before you go talk to King, because you don't like nobles, you talk to the guy, the blah, blah, you know, that sort of thing. Yeah, that was a good example that Mike had. It's like, say, you know, you hate a particular race and you need to talk to somebody from their race. Somebody from the group might want to attempt to use that suppressed negative trait against you to try and get you to behave yourself while you're talking to these filthy, stinking subhumans that you don't like. <laughs> Yeah, you tone down your arrogance or your vanity or whatever the hell that's basically getting in your way at that point. And that that's an interesting thing to me that like that's it's it's an amount of depth that I don't think I've seen in any other system thus far. I can't recall anything. I am not super versed in all the things role playing out there, but I'm sure there's probably something out there similar. But I don't know. I think they did a really, really interesting way of doing this, so and then moving on from those uh, type of things, we get into uh, the general special abilities. And it, once again, it's not my fault, Mike, that the dancing girls have come up in the seduction, but it's a thing that's going on <laughs> that that makes me think, like, as as I think we've discussed on the, the podcast before, there's been stuff that's been censored out of this system, like prostitution that originally existed they thought american audiences couldn't handle um and like so like, i don't even think it was that it was the fact that they didn't want to push the envelope just in case i that it still bothers me but yeah yeah like my my frustrated noises are because that irritates me that you would you would you know censor something like that or not give me the option to get additional materials which i'm still I'm still pushing for that, even though, like, we've got, like, 10 people subscribed to this podcast and are still trying <laughs> to grow. Like, if somebody who can influence someone is listening to this, like, I want the option to get some of that stuff back, even if it's, like, the dirty book folio, where that's all that's in there. <laughs> right. 
Well, because it's... Because I'm sorry, in, in medieval times, there was such things as prostitutes and whores and stuff. Not to say that it was a right thing. It was just, it was there and you want the option. So from when I was a, a wee child growing up in the tail end of the 80s and through the 90s, I saw that fantasy had largely been cleaned up, except for actually, I'm going to bring into it, Mike, that we both recently rewatched Willow not too long ago. Mm-hmm. And I, I watched that movie well, once a year at least. So, yeah. I uh, forgot that some. Um, Oh, uh, geez, pretty boy. I'm trying to remember his name. Val, Val Kilmer. Kilmer. Like his character was a complete man whore in that. I <laughs> completely well, missed you, that as a child. Did you know the iconic fighter from Pathfinder was based off of that character? <laughs> I did not know that. But yep. now that you mention it, I can totally see that the hairstyle was very similar. Mm-hmm. Which I find I was like, oh, that's that's why Valros is my my. My uh, my uh, avatar in on the message boards on Paizo. So mm-hmm. I love Mad Mart again, though. So, but uh, you've got skills in here besides just subduction. Uh, you've got animal husbandry. You've got calligraphy. Being a book printer. Being a fire eater. Um, much too. Just- much it runs the gamut of just about anything, yeah. Yeah, much to to kind of my and I think Demon Eric's dismay too. The, the a lot of Galukale it plays into some of these, uh, where but it's they like, actually you know, make sense with the. It Gotta does Lake, make so, sense. Yeah. It does make sense. Like I, when you're, when we read it in the core book, part of the reason I didn't put any real emphasis on it because it just seemed right. like a bunch of juggling balls, but. The, now that I'm seeing it, it's like, oh, it's kind of more this, like a, uh, yeah, a dexterity, a I handle objects well kind of thing. Yeah, like shell game, that sort of thing, yeah. Um, one that I want to mention here, too, is servant was another fine detail that they went into that had not occurred to me until I read it, uh, which was um, you may want to put the ranks in etiquette and get you know, two adventure points put in that you could know how it is to be a servant. And that might be something that's a a skill you can use to find employment and otherwise ingratiate yourself towards nobles. And a lot lot of the the skills are based around the, Hey, would this work as a profession? Well, the thing that's funny to me is as much as enhancing professions and stuff. So as much as whenever we, you know, used to play Pathfinder and I'd be the persuasive character, like an angle like that never even really occurred to me is like pretend to be a servant for a noble to get their Mm -hmm. ear, you know, and I I thought, okay, these guys are always thinking. Uh, Valet ventriloquism. That was one that I, yeah, you need to have some uh, galukale. Um, you gotta have, you gotta have, yeah, galookalers. So fun, fun thing for you guys. When we were, uh, playing our last session that I was DMing, uh, yeah, it, Eric couldn't join us until late. So I was harassing him that he was, he was nearly abducted by a roving band of galookalers. <laughs> and he just he he ran with that, so it was good. <laughs> he was talking about something about clown uh, remains all over him, <laughs> and needing yeah, yeah the the weather uh, eventually washing it off as we travel because it was a badge of honor of some type for him. <laughs> well, we. I wouldn't necessarily say Eric is afraid of clowns, but he definitely does not like clowns. So we always tease him about clowns every so often. And yeah, one of these days I got to get him to watch uh, killer clowns from outer space. Cause yeah, which really that, isn't that bad. That, it it's isn't that bad, bad but like there's, it has moments where it gets darker than you would think that it would. Yeah. And then it ends well, up. It sounds very campy, very goofy, but it's it not so goofy in spots. Yeah, it is. It absolutely is. But like, it, and also the ending, just like the dark tone that they bring up in it, the ending just kind of breaks it. And it's, yeah, uh, I, I suggest anybody who's not terrified of clowns, which like, I think there's three of our friends that I know, uh, Eric and Maria being two of them that are terrified of clowns. <laughs> like they should check that movie out because it's bizarre. 
Um, then when, when we get into some of the finer skills, uh, we get into trade secrets, which was an, an interesting thing where like there are some skills that are so fine uh, you need to put extra points and knowledge towards them otherwise you won't be able to do them so like uh, making dragon scales as part of armor clay oven stuff uh, making fireworks Weapons, yeah. um, it just really interesting to, to you know kind of have these fine techniques that might help you with certain checks you might need to make um, and another thing that I think just, you know, adds to the fact that the game uh, really lets you use multiple solutions to problems, which I really appreciate about it. Mm -hmm. Like um, there's no one right way to do it, yeah. Also, uh, since I'm looking at it right now on this page, Mike, prophecy and greater prophecy, how do you feel about that as, as, from a DM's perspective? They're kind of neat. Um, I don't know if I'd ever use them as a player. DM, eh, I don't know. They could be useful. See, it it kind of... Different ways of using fate points, basically. So much of it is give and take, though, is like I kind of feel like it. it's the only way to be sure as a DM is to, like, uh, DM or GM, take your pick, is to kind of give them, like, Miss Cleo answers... <laughs> It's like, oh, Basically. child, if you go here, a bad thing will happen to you. And stay away from that man. He only wants you for your money, child. Yeah. I... Like I said, not really my type of thing, but eh, I'm willing to I'm willing to put it in if somebody wants to do it. You know what I mean? It's just, yeah. yeah I... <laughs> that kind of like, in a weird way, it reminded me of... Um... Oh, what's that one class in Pathfinder? The um, where like you're you're learning Oracle? the mystery of yourself. Yes, thank you, oracles. Yeah, where like that would be a good fit if somebody was trying to do like an oracle type character in this setting. Um, but it's not as keenly sharpened as the t it's best of, terminology I can use where it's like the oracles, it's part of their destiny type thing. Right? So if I remember correctly, that's the one where you spend a fate point where it helps you. Yeah, you can s see vague things into the future towards certain things. And then the greater one, basically you spend a fate point and you can do it for everybody rather than just one person. Yeah. But Which it, greater prophecy is not bad. Except Single for prophecy, it costs yeah. 25 AP. It's like expensive, yeah. 5 AP for regular prophecy, 25 for greater prophecy. Like, you got to want it, man. And I'm not sure it's worth the coin with how, or, you know, the coin, I say. But. Yeah, I think it could be very useful for spending the points for it. It just, it you'd have to do it with a specific character type in mind. So, yeah. So the one thing that this book definitely doesn't fix is the problem with, it's like, man, there's so much that I want to spend on and like so little AP being rewarded. It doesn't give you more AP now. <laughs> you own this book, you get an extra 25 AP. <laughs> yeah, right. That so, would be awesome. <laughs> actually, there was a thing in here, I can't remember where it was, but some of these special abilities, special techniques, like um, they legit said, okay, if you're going to be in a group that is not going to be using it, but you're using the same character sheet, Mm -hmm. You can give those points back to yourself um, or you can ah. reassign them. And I'm like, okay, well that, that I don't see that scenario happening unless somebody else takes over your sessions or for some reason you're trying to port in a character that you had, you know, with somebody ah. else towards a new session at the same level. But I appreciate that point, they're yeah. thinking about it. Never thought about that way, but yeah, that makes good sense. Makes sense. Uh, so that brings us to chapter three, the advanced combat rules. Um, so again, uh, there's certain things here that I'm not quite a fan of, but I mean, obviously things like the rolling barrels, throwing small objects, dropping. Oh yeah, that's layer. that chapter. Yeah. Um, like that's. Using the terrain to your advantage kind of thing, yeah. It's, it's good that now we have the explanation on this, and like this is actually the main reason that I wanted to buy this uh, compendium, that I'm like, you know what, I'm just going to go ahead and get on the Kickstarter for it, 
because like this is what I wanted to do to spice up combat for you guys and mm-hmm. give us different ways to encounter enemies as opposed to they walk into the room, they start attacking you, mm-hmm. they hit you, you hit them, they're down. <laughs> Pretty much, yeah. Hit zone rules. Now here's the one that like I'm not quite a fan of and like you do appear to be able to pick and choose this right um but the hit zone there were the dice that we didn't understand how they work before where you've got different zones on you've got like goblinoid humanoid ogre they've got a picture of a mountain goat a wolf a bull uh you know chimera or not a chimera i am um, basilisk that's what i'm i'm looking for Mm-hmm. Um and the dragon and it shows you like oh if you roll this on a d20 that's what you hit and my problem remains the same with this in that I just don't see them spinning around in 360s and battles that like you hit all of like a creature like a dragon because like they have different like a, an 11 to 14 would be the front legs but a 17 to 18 is the hind and it's like well really depends on where you're standing doesn't it mm-hmm. there is and, well and this is a system that depends more on facing and stuff so yeah i don't understand it either but hey. there is a, a, a provision in here that i appreciate uh where you can attempt to attack a specific uh targeted attacks there we go so like uh their example one of them was like there's an orc that you want to attack his weapon hand. If you're willing to take the penalty, you can target straight so, for that. So, so he drops his weapon or something yeah, like that. Yeah, that makes sense to me. The I could attack him in in you know one part, but not the other. This doesn't quite make as much sense to me. But see, the only way that makes sense to me is if you're doing a ranged attack. And from a distance, you know what I mean? Because, oh, all right, it's a dragon so far. Oh, you, you shot and you hit him, but you hit him only in yeah, the way. I guess. Okay, I'm, that makes sense. But yeah, I just. Mm. As I'm looking at this again, I guess on the bipedals, it makes sense to me that it's like, oh, you could be hitting either arm depending on where you're standing to them. It's like that kind of makes sense. But like the, again, the uh, non-humanoids, like the, the dragons, especially with how massive they are. Like, that's where it falls apart for me. And I'm like, yeah. That's... Well, yeah. <laughs> like I said, humanoids, it kind of makes sense to a certain degree. But, well, hey, this is this is what, you know, his left arm is open now, so you make a strike at it. Okay, that, you know. <laughs> yeah. Um, let's see. Weak spot penalties. Uh, we Oh, yeah. The new thresholds. There are actually new thresholds for pain. Uh, that are brought up in this chapter, which was kind of interesting. Um, and like, I don't remember that part. So yeah. So like, there's uh, new disadvantages. Uh, brittle bones. Some people scream the moat they receive the slightest injury in battle oh. compared to others. Glass jaw. Not everyone can ignore a hit and keep fighting. Glass jawed characters get knocked to the ground more easily, lose hold of their weapons more often, and suffer uh, more from hits to the head or jaw. Um, and I appreciate the addition of those. Um, yeah, I remember that now, yeah. <laughs> more disadvantages and stuff. Some stuff on mounted combat, flying attacks, um, combat from chariot, tournament stuff. It's like I can see a, an area where this would come up if you people mm-hmm. wanted to participate in a tournament, but I don't know that that will come into any of the the uh, GMing I'm going to do in the near future. Um, but you can these these are more for long, long campaigns where this stuff will happen more often. Well, yeah. I ideally we are playing one of those, but yeah, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, but it's it's. I'm talking that we play in, in in real time for like years kind of thing. You know what I mean? Mm. Uh, let's see. So then we get to chapter four, special abilities in combat, uh, combat styles. And um, this is the one that looks most to me like feats. Because then here we start to get into prerequisites and uh, using AP points to get oh, yeah, the different advanced thing. combat style. Yeah, well, yeah. 
those are based on like, hey, I'm a dad gen buster or I'm a, um, I can't think of uh, specific, there's a bunch of different light things, basically. So one of the ones, like, for example, um, I saw that I appreciate, but like will probably never use because usually I'm a lover, not a fighter in these games, <laughs> uh, is nailed down. Whereas like you can use spear like weapons to just pin people to the ground. <laughs> so, <Yeah. laughs> uh, so that you've got to know pole arms. You've got to have a prerequisite of a 13 agility or 13 strength. And uh, 20 adventure points. Actually, if you can do it with agility, I might be able to pull that off with a character. Mm -hmm. It's a negative poor penalty, so that's a little rough. Yeah, I'm better with agility on my character than I am with strength as my one of my weak ones, but yeah. Different combat styles. Um, yeah, there's a bunch. 20 combats? There's a bunch of armed combat styles and a bunch of unarmed combat styles. Yeah. Some of these are passive skills, some are active. Uh, you've got like drop kicking, uh, frontal assault, doing a haymaker on somebody, even if you're brawling, um, jump attacks, powerful throw, shield slams. And... Yeah, there's quite a bit of new. They added about. I don't know if it's quite twice as much as what they had, but it's a good chunk of it. Probably at least 40% more than what they already had. Uh, the ones I like, some of the combat combats, well, combat abilities or combat special abilities I liked were the like Reign of Iron was one of my favorite ones, which is makes uh, you know, throwing builds pretty effective. Like, oh, I can throw three daggers in one, you know, like one attack action kind of thing. Okay, and then we get to chapter five where we've got the group rules. Mm -hmm. And one of the questions, I think, would be whether we wanted to do some of these group rules in the group. And, of course, we'll have to talk about this to everybody else next time we're gaming. But I was, I was in favor of a lot of these and kind of was leaning this way and kind of doing stuff sort of this way whenever we were doing last yeah. time. Because, uh, like, group fate point pool, I was kind of doing a, a loose version of that where it's like I was just doling out fate points when shit was getting unfair because of bad dice rolls. Um, also, as I was saying to Mike earlier, because he wouldn't be seeing this, it's really weird and meta to me I that you've got the Thor Whaler chick, the dwarf, and, and the uh, witch with her cat like playing this tabletop game within the setting of the universe in a tavern or building of some type. It's just weird to me, but uh, yeah. Uh, different themed groups that seemed a bit extreme to me, but the expanded use of fate points in particular uh, was something that I thought was kind of cool. Like the riddle example i probably would try and mitigate it before it got to that point but that's mm -hmm. that's useful um there was another optional rule in here that i can't remember exactly where it showed up in this chapter but i was discussing with mike where it's like you can avoid permanent character death if you're willing to sacrifice your ability to get one of your fate points permanently. So it's like... So instead of normally three, you got two, or normally two, you got one, yeah. Yeah. Sort of like the nine lives version of a cat, I suppose, with a player character. Except it's, uh, you know... Oh, uh, yeah, there it is. Uh, Gul Gulgari's... Oh, Gul Gulgari's Wings, is it? I'm not sure on pronunciation here because I'm bad at pronouncing new words. Uh, or maybe not. Every gaming group reacts differently to the option cheat death. It grants character multiple lives. Uh, this has both advantages and disadvantages. One advantage is that the player can continue to play a beloved hero. This can be good for a player morale, especially if the hero's death would have been due to a, f a few unlucky rolls. Few people enjoy saying goodbye to a favorite hero or creating a new character. One disadvantage, however, is that this reduces tension. Players tend to be less careful with their characters and take greater risks because they know they can probably survive. Since some players enjoy tension arising from high-risk scenes, this can have an effect of devaluing fights and other dangerous situations. 
On the other hand, some players pay more attention to their characters because they do not have to constantly fear death. Discuss the cheat death option with the player ahead of time. Uh, with the player group ahead of time, does the group feel that the character death should be permanent? Do they think that something can be undone by sacrificing a resource? So, once again, it's you know home brew it to whatever works for your group. Well, also in this system, you you don't have spells like race dead. So yeah, that's a good point. That's one mm-hmm. that I hadn't really considered, but yeah. I didn't even think about it until, until now myself, so yeah. But yeah, like, I I think that's really fair. And I also think that's fair that another provision they have in here for cheat death is that it, it doesn't matter if you used up your fate points. Like, the thing that you are namely sacrificing is your ability to use one of the fate points permanently from your character sheet. Um, and I think that's fair. I, as a game master, would want to find a way to try and mitigate it and save the person's ass before it got to that point. But as so long right. as it's not something like, hey, guys, you go ahead. I'm going to hang out in this burning building. What? Are you saving a child? No, nah, I just feel like being in the burning building. Like, that dude's dead because he's an idiot. And screw that guy. He he's deserves a whole the new character. Exactly. You know, like it, it depends on what your player has done, whether or not they they deserve permadeath for a character. Well, if it's, hey, I did some heroic thing where it's like, I had a chance to save this person and, you know, they die from that, eh, you know. Yeah, it's like uh, whenever you're watching a movie But if you're doing something, it something intentionally stupid, you deserve to die. Yeah, well, it's like when you're watching a movie or something or reading a book and you're like, somebody does something really heroic and you're like, oh man, I don't want that character to die. It's like... That's where you kind of, in my opinion, pull out the stops. Is like, oh yeah, mm-hmm. somehow narrowly cheated death because that's more awesome to me than yeah. Well, they they sacrifice themselves and we're playing an edgy game here, guys. So let's be uh, edgy. They're dead. <clears throat> but yeah, if you're gonna go poke a dragon, so to speak, you know what I mean, <laughs> by yourself, <laughs> yeah, with no armor and uh, so I'm a little sick of it. But the, like the the. Uh, the South Park back in the day was they're, they're making fun of Steve Irwin. It's like, watch me sneak up behind him and stick my thumb up his ass. <laughs> oh, right now he's really pissed. Yeah, if you're going to pull a Steve Irwin where you're going to stick your finger up a dragon's ass, you deserve to die. <laughs> That's all I'm going to say. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> forgot about that but yeah next uh next up here we've got chapter six professions and d- definitely guys if you're like interested in some of the different professions here read through it Pastry chef. <laughs> yeah well that's immediately where i'm going because i'm like are you effing kidding me like uh the warrior the escaped slave okay yeah those make sense farmer yep the, the smith yeah they're adventurers all the time uh, guides, wandering sword, Helean warrior. Hey, I like that girl with her ponytail. Anyway, <laughs> you got the mechanist, which was like an interesting tinkerer kind of thing to me. Yeah, kind of. Um, noble, different warriors. Here we are at the pastry chef. What the effing hell? <laughs> so, I, I. Mike had pointed out to me whenever we were first waiting for this to drop. I'm like, why the hell is this going to have pastry chefs in it? And Mike's like, well, anybody can be an adventurer, Morris. Maybe people sacked his village or something, and he couldn't take anyone. And like immediately, my mind goes to, you've you've the, ruined the third souffle I was working on this day. That is it. I've had enough. And like that's you know what sets him off. Vengeance is mine. <laughs> But no, the the village being destroyed makes much more sense. Um, but yeah, also in this, we've got uh, subdivisions. Like, to show, again, the detail that's given in this setting, um, you've got pastry chefs, you've got chocolatiers, and you've got shumkus makers. Which are marshmallow guys. Yeah, which they even go into that it was accidentally discovered by an alchemist one day, is how we have marshmallows in this world. Which um, is cool. I'm really curious. Like, I'm assuming that uh, 
Shamkus maker is like Shamkus is German. I'm probably pronouncing that wrong. Soon, but yeah. So I apologize to any people who can actually properly speak German. That might Sorry be for butchering your, your beloved <laughs> language. Which is also funny, Morris, the other day, I downloaded a book, How to Learn German, just because of this game. So, <laughs> yeah. Let me know how you, you come on that. Is <laughs> Yeah, we'll see. <laughs> uh, I want to, well, because I just want to learn how to pronounce the words a little less ignorantly so to speak you know what i mean yeah and if i and if it gives me a little extra knowledge about you know how the german syntax and everything works even better you know but one of the little things that i uh did with this um for our last session that we were in i did a little offshoot where our group had to deal with some orcs and for uh, my own amusement, in part, because I was feeling such consternation towards pastry chefs, I decided to create a, a character that the others had to deal with in this uh, little adventure where he was trying to save his family from the orcs and he wasn't necessarily listening to everybody else, who was a chocolatier who got his start as an assassin who originally poisoned chocolates and found out he had a talent for that. And was trying to retire as a chocolatier, and, and I knew exactly. That's exactly why you did that because I would <laughs> mention the pastry chefs. But yeah, it's like, well, you know, if you can't beat them, join them or make them a part of your campaign. <laughs> hey, it works, you know. Uh, scholars, servants, shepherds. Hey, go easy on the shepherds. <laughs> Shepherdesses. <laughs> yeah. All right. Uh, Smiths, yep. Well, that and you kind of do that for a living, but well, did it no. The reason I pause on shepherds is those who who really yeah. know is like I used to raise sheep for 4-H back in the day. So, well, that's the baddest, the most badass shepherd of all time, Randall Four. But yeah, <laughs> I, I'm more a fan of Matt from Coffin. <laughs> well, I am too, but Rand Matt wasn't a shepherd, so you know, <laughs> may as well have been. <laughs> well, yeah. Oh, uh, man. So the one day I was uh, discussing that uh, that series with Jeremy, I think we've told everybody before, but I'm just going to say it again because this is what we do on the podcast. Tell the yeah. same stories over again. But um, there are always uh, been goodies. Jeremy was, was asking me on a canoe trip we took with uh, some other friends. Like so once he found out I was through the series, he's just like, hey, what do you think about Perrin and Wheel of Time? I was like, I hate him. It's like, what? He's so noble. It's like, yeah, that's exactly why I hate him. Like, he's he's like every mealy mouthed, I can't make a decision, I don't know how to handle women moment that I've ever had. And it drives me <laughs> nuts. All wrapped into one character. Yeah, like, it, it's painful to listen to some of the chapters with Perrin and Fael where it's like, oh, light, she can't want me to yell at her. It's, Stop, parent. Just stop. Like, you're embarrassing yourself and you're embarrassing me by proxy. <laughs> pretty much he was my least favorite of the three male characters well three main male leads but I didn't hate him but yeah I did like Matt the best because he was such a rapscallion but yeah well just like the characters I like to play the reason I really liked Matt was was is like he is the least like me overall while still having some of my traits mm -hmm. that's pretty much yeah like his clever ways of doing things though i kind of think of ways like that but i'm all, yeah i don't know matt is just he's a lovable scamp he's the lovable scamp you know yeah. what i mean and with the the luck and the persuasion it like it's like i said before he, it's all he about ultimately who does the right thing yeah it might be just because he doesn't want you know naive to yell at him again but or whatever but well, it's, it's. I'm just going to show you that I'm not as bad as people <laughs> make me out to be. Well, it's it's all about who you want to be more like, not who you are already like. Which, ironically enough, is a thing that comes up in the Wheel of Time series multiple times, mm -hmm. where both, uh, well, all three of them do it. Is like Matt and Perrin and I wish and I, was, I wish I had his way with women. <laughs> yeah, it's like I wish I understood things like Rand does. It's like he doesn't understand them any better than you, Matt. It's like I have it's the knowledge. Just of you just the like us, like. 
you know, the grass is greener on the other side of the, you know, the, the farmstead, so to speak. Well, and that's one of the things I got to give Robert Jordan and then later uh, Brandon Sanderson well is like other than that one chapter about the avenging your father from a trout. <laughs> <laughs> like, for, for I'm still using the, I, I appreciate that Telmanis said that. I don't really appreciate that Matt was going that nuts that we got to the point to set it up. But right. <laughs> regardless, uh, I, I think for the most part, they really handled the human experience really well. And I don't know how much of it was um, Robert Jordan's wife uh, helping him edit. She but was quite a bit of quite he, a bit of influence on him so i honestly don't know like he he as particularly for a male and coming from the male perspective yes ladies who are listening all two of you who are listening to this podcast i don't necessarily know what the women experience is like very well but uh he seemed to really kind of capture their humans too they have mm -hmm emotions and dreams and and shortcomings too so the, li the more liberal version of you know us or whatnot but finally to bring us back on point uh we get to chapter seven which is archetypes and mm, this was this honestly this was the one that i kind of glazed over on and and didn't worry about so much so yeah and you really didn't miss anything like say except except for the cute little story that they had ingrained with the different characters but yeah so like you've got your uh farmer your thorwellian smith your... this would be your uh pathfinder's version of the iconic characters this is the iconic witch, or this is the iconic farmer kind of thing. But you yeah. got your Dajin Basker, or Busker, who, yeah. like, it looks to me like I'm totally not Japanese, except for I am everything that is Japanese. Is <laughs> <laughs> kind of. so trying hard to be a samurai with tie-dye armor. Uh, a noble... A Horasian Balian, Horasian Explorer. Hey, cutie. Uh, uh, Babrakan Scholar, North Marcher Warrior. And then we are like, every ending is a new beginning. And then we get into Appendix where you get some uh, sweet new weapons like whips and slings. I know that you brought up Mike. Yeah, new, new weapon styles, uh, whips and slings. Which the sling is actually pretty decent, so you know it's not it's not you know longbow decent, but it's you know hey it's still useful and it's like hey there's there's you know in real life so why the hell not here so you know but that's pretty much the compendium, folks. So uh, Mike, I don't know, did you have anything else you thought we should add to this? No, going into this, it wasn't quite what I expected. But overall, it's still a pretty good supplement. So, dude, overall, I don't know what the hell I was expecting, but uh, like, I came for more interesting combat and came out with instead, like, whoa, there is a hell of a lot more detail to, to build that things with. Thought, you know, <laughs> yeah. Like, I, I, on the one hand, I'm like, this is amazing the amount of different stuff that they put in here that, like, now I kind of want to work, like, with the chocolatier, I kind of want to work it in. Mm -hmm. But it's also like, F you guys, you made so much more work for me. <laughs> like... Well, that's what supplements are. <laughs> you have to realize that's what they do. Yeah, a little bit. But well, if it excites you enough that goes, wow, that's, I never thought of that. And I was like, I want to do something like that somewhere. But, you know, that's, hey, they're, well, one of the things we were also discussing is how, like, overall, it feels like Pathfinder is a lot more combat heavy, which, like, for somebody like who games like Doug, especially, it's all about that damage output. And, like, that's. But. Uh, I, I, I must confess, I do enjoy that to a certain extent, too. But, yeah. See, for me, like, that's. My eyes are glazing over. It's like, yeah, because, again, for the umpteen millionth time, I'm, I'm the fluff guy around here. It's like, I want that compelling story. So See, I like clever ways of doing more damage or mm. options. It's not necessarily just like, I just want to add to it. 
but if it, they do it in a way that's like, huh, I never thought of that. That is what does it for me. Yeah. Well, I definitely had that uh, a number of times going through this. It's like, huh, I never thought of that possible scenario. So there's mm -hmm. something else. Yeah, that... that's, that's, like I said, it's so like, if it makes me go, hmm, then they're doing their job. So, you know, I don't want to just be able to ways more and more ways to pile on the damage. But if you make it a different way t for me to achieve that, that's a different story. You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> I'm not all about, oh, I'm the power gamer of power gamers and power gamers. Like, I am the Godzilla of the lizard guy. But no. So uh, one of the uh, dudes that I watch play video games regularly keeps going off about min-max the shit out of it. Yeah, min-max. It's like, I hate that. I, I hate the push for one-dimensional characters who are just one-trick ponies and, like, I recently watched um, some of him giving a guy advice on playing Pillars of Eternity, which, you know, is basically is the new Baldur's Gate, more or less. Um, and they were talking about a group of min-maxers in different directions is always going to be more effective than well-rounded characters. And it's like, okay, on the one point, that's true, but one, that hurts my soul... And two, it, it, like there's there's always going to be that point, guys, where like you're separated from a group in some fashion, where it's like, huh, boy, it would be really good if we knew more than one person who could heal in this group, or more than one person who could do ranged damage in this group, because <laughs> we kind of need those things to save our assets right now. Yeah. Well, it's like. You should have ways to do, you should have not be basically, hey, oh, I'm a, a master of combat, uh, except, you know, I only master <laughs> one way of doing that to the detriment of everybody else kind of thing. Yeah, I mean, like, I'm maybe I'm an idiot in all this and I should be min maxing the shit out of everything all the time, but. I'm always the type of guy who instead I want to go uh, jack of all trades and master of one, you know, to do the the small change on the the classic saying is like I, I, there's the one thing that's going to be I'm going to dump everything towards that. And usually that's being the talky guy. And then yeah, other but than you that, still have other way, you know, it's, it's not like. Well, and that's something I okay. super appreciate about this game over uh you know like i can't really say shadow run yet because we haven't played enough of it yet mm. but like definitely over pathfinder uh like there is more than one way to get to talk to a person and sometimes you know one route is not the most effective you might use one of the alternate skills that the the group has knowledge of right. like sometimes it's gather information but sometimes maybe you're going through more shady channels than that well yeah uh, I, for some reason my brain just decided to fart on me so but yeah like i am going <laughs> to consistently worry about it this way and like uh there's no possibility of any of this other thing coming up if you're narrow-minded to the point that now hey i'm i'm a fighter i am probably going to focus on this type of weapon but i don't know how to do anything else that's the problem if you can hey oh uh, yeah i'm going to focus on this weapon but i can still survive with these other things that's the way you really should look at it. Because, hell, there's things I like doing. You know, I'm going to... I'm a wizard. I like boomy spells. Okay, I'm going to spe specialize on boomy spells. But you should still be able to cast a charm spell here and there without exo... You know, without no possibility of ever using it in or correctly. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, All right, Mike, I'm calling it. We need to wrap this up. <laughs> Yep, it's a good time. To, I think it's a good... I think we got what we needed, and yeah. And we hope you did, too. <laughs> so... <laughs>
<laughs> Catch us on the next podcast and email it. Damn it. Tell us what you want to hear. Yeah, Tell if you have any questions about this episode, you want us to, you know, hey, I want you to go a little more in depth on this way. We'll do that. So, yeah. We're trying to bow to the, you know, yeah. Bow the, to all the, ten of you who like tell your friends. We're to going to bow to the listener when possible. Tell, but, tell your friends to subscribe and listen to our damn podcast too. <laughs> yeah, subscribe, damn it! <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> all right, later, everybody. <laughs> yeah. The theme music used for this podcast, "Orc March" by Snowflake, featuring Wolf Sebastian and Spitting Merkaba, is available from CC Mixter under the Creative Commons Attribution 3.0 license. You can find it at dig.ccmixter.org or find a direct link to it and its license information in our Blind Sense podcast descriptions. All right, kids, it's decision time. You're a pastry chef and your village has just been attacked by a roving band of galookalers, or, as Demon Eric would put it, gorkalers. They've made off with your significant other, Your boyfriend or girlfriend you like to sometimes make kissy face with, and you can still hear the cries in the distance, but all you have is a rolling pin, and maybe some paring knives for your fruit filling. That's not going to be enough, you know. So what do you do? Will you barter with the blacksmith, a cart full of pastries in exchange for a good weapon, a sword or bow? Or maybe you could make some sort of deal with him where he gets a lifetime supply if he hooks you up just this one time. But would he go for that? I mean, what are the chances of your coming back alive? What do you do? Send your answer to Volantrix at gmail.com. That's Volantrix spelled V-A-L-A-N-T-R-I-X. Vengeance is mine. Quoth the pastry chef.